Well, joining me now from Toronto is Tony Dean. He's an independent Canadian senator who was instrumental in getting the new legislation passed. And in Regina, we have Denise Batters. She's a senator for Canada's Conservative Party and an outspoken critic of the decision to legalize recreational marijuana. Thanks, both of you, for joining us. Tony Dean, let me start with you. You worked hard to push this through. Tell me why. Well, we've had uh, significant challenges with uh, cannabis in Canada for quite some time. And it became clear that 95 years of prohibition uh, wasn't working. We have the, uh, the highest rate of uh, youth consumption globally, and adults uh, are relatively high users in this country as well. All of that uh, drug is drawn from a $7 billion illegal market in Canada, which is not tested for potency or, or contaminants. We're particularly worried about the impact of cannabis uh, on the health of young people and also the social impacts of, of criminalization for relatively small amounts of possession. So we had a newly elected government three years ago that decided that legalization and strict regulation was the better route. Um, I thought that might be the right idea, but certainly over the last several months of examination of the legislation in the Senate, it seemed to me that it's uh, uh, far better and far more likely to be successful than prohibition. So I was happy to be the sponsor of, um, of this legislation in Canada's Senate. Right. Denise Battis, prohibition doesn't work. That's the message from Tony Dean. Tell me why you disagree. Well, what we have actually in Canada is legalization, which goes a fair bit further than decriminalization, which I think a lot more Canadians would have been on board with. Um, I think that this is the wrong way to go. We're the only second country in the entire world, Uruguay being the first, um, to take this particular route. And the way that this government has gone about it, they've done it in too rushed of a fashion. Um, we have had so many people telling them that they're not ready to implement. Provinces, police, municipalities, indigenous groups, all of these different people have continued to say that we're not ready. Plus, they've done it in a fashion where they say that their goal is to protect children, yet they've imposed a minimum age of only 18 years old. They have uh, allowed home cultivation, which puts that um, illegal drug in, in um, the homes of children e too easy to access. They haven't allowed enough safeguards. Um, I think that it's too rushed. We're not ready yet. And uh, this government has continued to push through just to have a political deadline met and to make one of their election promises actually um, finally stick because they've broken several of them. Tony, let me bring up someone who agrees with Denise and disagrees with you, and it's a nation state, Russia. Russia says this is a breach of Canada's international legal obligations. Is that true? Well, um, it, technically, uh, it is true, but I take the position, and I think I'm supported by many others in this, in saying that with respect to cannabis, the country wasn't doing very well in living up to its obligations to, uh, to tackle the problems of cannabis in Canada, when where the uh, one of the largest consuming nations in the world, uh, that doesn't signal success. So um, the, I, I, I think that certainly my view is that we will have a far stronger likelihood of being able to tackle cannabis and its harms and the $7 billion illegal market by legalizing and strictly regulating the drug. Um, I think that uh, decriminalization is always an option and uh, some U.S. states have taken that approach. But of course, decriminalization replaces uh, jail time in many mm -hmm. cases for small offenses with right. ticketing, but it doesn't eradicate or start to tackle the massive illegal market that we have in Canada. That stays in place. And that is the main failing of, of, um, of, of the, of the uh, decriminalization approach. Look, we have, we have to our south nine U.S. states and the District of Columbia who, having had a medical regime, have now moved to recreational cannabis regimes. One of those states, California, has a population that is larger than Canada's. So, yes, we are the second uh, national state to legalize, but um, uh, there are more than a few uh, states to our south, closer to home, who've gone down this road. And we've learned from some of their experience and some of their mistakes in, in designing a, a quite cautious and prudent approach right. to 
uh, the legalization and regulation of cannabis. And, and Denise, looking at some of those states, a lot of them point to the positives being that they can tax marijuana and they get, they get good money that they can use to build schools and hospitals and so forth. Why not replace a $7 billion illegal industry that's lining the pockets of criminals with a $4 billion legal industry where tax money could be put to good use? Well, what we've heard actually, and I made a trip to Washington DC a couple of months ago to get uh, straight answers because we weren't getting those answers from the Trudeau government and their ministers in Canada. So we went to Washington DC to speak directly to people high up in the US administration and also to speak to people that have had those um, actual examples in states where they have legalized and we heard some very alarming things including about how Colorado where they have allowed home cultivation that's a really major problem and for this government to say that it's strictly regulating yet they're allowing every single household in Canada to have four plants and what we've heard is that is a way that the black market has used in Colorado to expand the black market. And so Colorado is actually the number one black market in the U.S., even though they have a legalized market. So my major concern is continues to be, you know, you might get a small amount of tax dollars to go to, to hospitals and education. But what we should really be trying to do is protect children, especially when we know that marijuana has such major mental health impacts on the developing brains right. of youth. And that's why we had major medical organizations right. saying we should have a much higher minimum age. Yeah, and I'd love to have this debate again with, with doctors looking at you and, know, the medical side of things where we look at it, whether it's a slippery slope or not. That's, that's really interesting. Tony Dean, very finally, are you worried about what might happen with the United States given that if we look at the other country that's gone down this route, Uruguay, many U.S. banks are not doing business with Uruguayan banks they have these federal regulations against drug trafficking and so forth they've got drug drug war legislation intact are you worried that somehow bilaterally canada's relationship with the united states is going to get soured because of the legalization of marijuana i'm not at all and and the main reason for that is about one third of american citizens are now living in states that either have medical or recreational cannabis. So in, in the US, um, uh, the cannabis legalization and regulation has moved faster and further than, uh, than uh, in Canada. Uh, we are taking a much more precautionary approach. And I think we've seen signs recently of the, of the uh, president in the US starting to signal that he may be taking a laxer approach and recognizing the ability of U.S. states to move to legal regimes. Uh, I think this is a, a, a movement that probably is difficult to stop now, um, certainly in the U.S. Um, other countries will make their own determination about whether they want to go there or not. But um, I'm not concerned about uh, Canada's relationship with the, with the United States. Um, in some respects, we're followers rather than out front of them. Okay. Tony Dean and Denise Batters, I thank you both for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Let's bring in two new guests now. From Toronto, we have Jody Emery. She's a cannabis activist, civil liberties advocate, and public speaker for Cannabis Culture Magazine and Pot TV. In Vancouver, we have Pamela McColl. She's a campaigner against legalized marijuana and a member of Clear the Air Now, part of a national coalition opposing the law. Pamela, let's start with you. Tell me why you're against this. Why is it such a big problem for you? Well, you know, I represent 87% of Canadians who don't use marijuana. I also represent uh, the world's population who don't use marijuana, which is the vast majority of people. You know, there's been very good reasons why this drug has not been legalized around the world. And, you know, I just listened to everything Senator Tony Dean just said, and everything that, just, that he just said was pure propaganda. I mean, it is not based in fact. The fact that we have in America you know, California and different states going to legalization, he didn't tell you that there's also an immense pushback. In Colorado, over 80% of the towns and cities have now bans in place, not allowing it. California, it's around 70% bans. The public, when they start to realize the mistake of legalization and what this does to their communities, they're pushing back, as they've done in Holland and other places around the world. And that's exactly what happened in 1992 when 
parents realized a generation had gone to marijuana from late 1970s to 1992, and they pushed back, and they elected Ronald Reagan. So the power of the people, if you want to talk about social activism, I am a social activist. Jody Emery, your other guest, is not a social activist. She's a capitalist. She makes money of selling marijuana. And she's been, and she, I mean, she pleaded guilty to trafficking charges last year. She sells marijuana to make money. Okay, well, let's, let's, the other let's, thing that okay, Tony Dean mentioned, hold on, hold on for a second. Okay, Canada so has a high rate of okay, use. So, so but, let's, let's but get, the problem. Yeah, let's get Jody to defend herself, yeah? Um, because in a way, I'd, I would have loved for you to be, you know, uh, locking horns with Tony Dean, but I don't want this to become you responding to everything Tony said. Let's get you to respond to what Jody says. But first, Jody, respond to what Pamela said about you. Go ahead, Jody. Well, first of all, I've been a cannabis legalization activist since 2004. I was a magazine editor, and we never sold cannabis. Our first cannabis franchise opened in April 2016, after I ran for a liberal nomination supporting the legalization campaign. I've been a political candidate for office four other times in the province of British Columbia. So I'm not making money off of cannabis. It was a civil disobedience activism campaign to demonstrate what legalization should look like. But I should note that it's interesting Pam is so concerned about cannabis when she admits she doesn't use it or even care for it. And in fact, when she says she represents all people who don't use cannabis, there are a great deal of people who don't use cannabis who do support cannabis law reform because they realize that the criminal law causes far more harm than cannabis has or ever will, and that the criminal law costs Canadians hundreds of millions of dollars every year to go after people peaceful, non-violent citizens for consensual transactions and behaviors and activities. If Pam is so concerned about the devastation to society so, caused so by drugs, why is she not campaigning to close down all of the alcohol distribution points and alcohol bars and government alcohol wholesalers who cause direct death and devastation, okay. disease and crime every minute of every day okay, so when cannabis is used as medicine? Okay, let's get a response. People. Let's get a response then okay, from, from Pamela. Right. So Pamela, look, okay, just because okay. let me let me let, okay. let me sort of add to that and, and you can fold in your response uh, with this. Let me add to that the question that just because you're in the majority doesn't necessarily make you right. Go ahead, Pam. Well, the fact that Jody Emery just pivoted, she pivoted from legalization over to decriminalization, which I support. The fact that this legislation, if you sell marijuana to a minor, you're going to jail for 14 years. How, how is that liberal? How is that, how is that improving our drug laws? I find that draconian. I think that that's a terrible policy. I don't think that hey, anyone should get 14 I, years. We agree. For selling a drug that they don't even think is harmful, you know? So I think, hey, hey wait a minute, I'm talking now. So, you also have self-proclaimed yourself as a capitalist because I've listened to your interviews. You are a capitalist. You want legalization so you can make money. And you've been very annoyed that the industry, the big international pot industry that's taken over this country, you know, you've been annoyed that you've been shut out of that now. Like, you set this up to make money. You, you want to make money from marijuana. Okay. So don't play the social okay. activist but, but, thing. But, and when you're but talking Pamela, about beyond, dead kids, okay. so there if are we can more move dead beyond, kids if and we can harm children beyond, from marijuana on, use than from prison. Pamela, if we can move beyond whether Jody's making money out of this or not, it would be interesting to see if you could address her question about alcohol. Alcohol is arguably more destructive than marijuana. Do you have as much of a problem with that? Well, arguably... You compare it, this is a talking point of the pot lobby. To do things about the argument with alcohol. One, 80% of people use alcohol. There is no way any government is ever going to prohibit it. It will never happen. Marijuana in Canada is 12%. We can keep it under control. We'd like to see it around 4%. That's a good goal for us. Not more people using, which is what the industry wants, what Jody Emery wants. When you're looking at alcohol and you're talking about comparing it with marijuana, you cannot do that without going and looking at specific cases. When was the last time you saw somebody die from secondhand smoke standing next to someone with a beer? You've got to look at it in individual cases. And you cannot make blanket statements that marijuana is safer than alcohol. It, that's just a not, that's a talking point. It's a piece of propaganda. Okay, it's not so, true. Jody, You've got to look okay. at Little Haven Dubois, 14-year-old's okay. dead. 
Okay. Dead from Jody. marijuana use. Come in, Jody. Well, I would say let's pretend cannabis is as harmful as alcohol. Prohibiting it won't make it safer. Having tough laws won't make it safer. And lying about it won't make it safer. So if cannabis is indeed harmful, we can't make it safer by making people afraid of it or, or being tough on people for it. But I do have to note, Pam, you and I do agree that these tough new laws are ridiculous. And I find it a little surprising. I'm shocked, actually, that you're speaking exactly the same words I speak when we agree that the government here in Canada is actually passing tougher laws. We're moving from eight offenses under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act for cannabis to 45 new federal offenses with increased penalties, some of them going from seven-year maximums to 14-year maximums, which restricts judges' ability to hand out lesser sentences. And the government has pledged over a quarter billion dollars federally for more marijuana law enforcement and hundreds of millions of dollars provincially and tens of millions in each city, we're actually seeing a new recriminalization of cannabis in many respects. And it is for the benefit of big corporate interests and former cops and politicians and industry insiders. And that's unfortunate because we only see law reform coming because of peaceful civil disobedience. It's because of people who break the law openly and challenge it in court that the courts have ordered the government of Canada to provide more access. So the government is still talking about restrict and limit access to cannabis. Well, I mean, you and, and I, using you and I talking differ. points like Pam's to say it's dangerous. Yeah. Pam? Well, I'll let Pam It's speak. not a talking <laughs> point that it's dangerous. We have 27,000 studies that substantiate the fact that it's not safe. Marijuana is not safe for human consumption. Fact of science. Absolutely. There's... Ooh. Look at Health Canada. Men should not use well, marijuana if they want to have children. That's the government of Canada. The government that just legalized this drug says men should not use marijuana if they want to have children. And they legalized it. How do you do that and not repeat the whole experiment with thalidomide? How do you do that and not have the taxpayer now at jeopardy of being sued down the road when all these young men who don't know the risk of tedesser cancer, of sterility, all these issues that can come with using high potency marijuana, didn't know. And this government allowed them to go and buy this product. We, the taxpayers, are going to get sued down the road. And that's one of the reasons that this should not happen. I don't but the main reason it shouldn't happen is that this drug is not safe for human consumption. Nobody should be touching this drug. And so my job is demand reduction. This is what you do. My job now is to tell people, don't use this stuff. Stay away from it. Stay out of a psychiatric ward. You know, okay. don't touch this stuff. Okay, it let is me give terrible. Jody, Jody and you've final got an 20 industry seconds. who wants you to use it, just Pam, like tobacco. Pam, we're out of time, but I want to give Jody a final response. Well, 20 yep. seconds, please, Jody. Human beings have been using cannabis for thousands of years. Our bodies have the endocannabinoid system within. Our brain and our bodies are designed to receive cannabis. Cannabinoids are in mother's breast milk for babies. Thousands and thousands of years of research and science shows that cannabis is indeed safe. It reduces obesity. It improves lung health. It improves mental cognitive functioning. This is according to Harvard and, and researchers all over the, the world. Problem you can in. see all of these studies like in my testimony to the government the and on. Okay. okay, I've got to wrap, both exactly of you. Listen, I, I really appreciate you both taking the time to come on the Newsmakers. I'd love to have you both on again in the future, but I've got to move on for now. Pamela McCall and Jody Emery, thank you very much. Sure.